probably many of you have seen over the years or remember as a child seeing a man with a sandwich board with the words, the end is nigh. And some people make fun of such uh, scenes and such images. The message of this chapter is more definitive. It is the end is now. The end has come. Ezekiel and the prophets before him had been declaring to Jerusalem, to Judah, of impending judgment. Ezekiel now in the the words of God says judgment has come. Judgment is not only near, judgment has arrived. And this judgment in the chapter is described by the following phrases. It is called the end in verse 2 and verse 6. It is called an evil in verse 5. It is called the morning, the time, the day of trouble in verse 7. It is called the day. The blossoming rod in verse 10. Again, the time and the day, verse 12. In verses 14 and 15, it's called the trumpet, the sword, the pestilence. Verse 19, it's called the day of the wrath of the Lord. And in verses 25 and 26, it's called destruction and mischief. It can be difficult to read these chapters. As we said already earlier on, this chapter really is continuing from the former chapter, chapter 6. The prophet here in chapter 7 seeks to press home to the hearts and minds of his hearers that there's no more space left for any carelessness or indifference. Repentance must be now. As Paul writes to the Corinthians in those words, now is the accepted time. In other words, not that it's okay now and maybe okay tomorrow, but now is the unique accepted time of salvation. People live in the folly and the foolishness of thinking, I'll put off religion, I'll put off repentance to a later date. I'll live the way I want now, and eventually then I will repent. Ezekiel has no truck with such idea. He says to the people, the judgment that has been prophesied through Isaiah and Jeremiah, and they give time to the people, there is no more time. This judgment is imminent. This judgment is at your door. This judgment is in your face. In this chapter, we will see five main headings. We'll see the end is now in verses 1 to 6. The end is near in verses 7 to 15. The escape is feeble in verses 16 to 19. The end of the temple in verses 20 to 22 and the end of all things, or everything, in verses 23 to 27. One of the chief problems with people is they think that things will continue, that things will continue as they have been, that really there's no need to worry. We'll sort things out there. We'll return to normality is one of the phrases that is used in our day. People live in a kind of a dream, a kind of a false assurance that things are going to get better. People say, you know, I've heard people saying in recent weeks, there's a better day coming. That's not the message of the scriptures for those who do not believe God. The the message of the scriptures is that a worse day is coming. This is not popular, of course, and we lose friends with such a message. Ezekiel lost many friends, Jeremiah and Isaiah and all the prophets and indeed the apostles, who most of them were slain for their preaching. When Wycliffe back in the 14th century was 
sending out the Lollards, they would spend their time, the Lollard priests would spend their time writing out at least the text, the whole text of the New Testament by hand. And they would go out to preach in the countryside of England. For many of them, their first sermon was their last. The message of the scripture is not popular. Even as believers, we, we read such a chapter and we, and we might be tempted to say, oh, I, I need something a bit more encouraging. <laughs> I need something a bit more uplifting. I, I feel down. I, I need something better than this. Well, brothers and sisters, there's nothing better than the Word of God and nothing better than the truth. The truth is what we need. In a day of uh, where truth has fallen in the streets, to use the, the prophetic phrase, we need to exalt the truth. We need to proclaim the truth, all the truth. Again, Paul, in his confidence when he's speaking to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, says that his confidence was rooted in the fact that he had declared to them all the counsel of God, that he withheld nothing that was good uh, for them and necessary for their souls. So let's look at this chapter together. We'll just walk through the chapter. We'll look at these five headings and the, the points that are contained within these main chief points in the chapter. Verses 1 to 6, the end is now. How did they know that the end had come? It wasn't by looking because even as Ezekiel preached, people would look out the window and said, what do you mean, Ezekiel? Look, everything looks well. Everything is fine outside my door. The reason why Ezekiel knew that the end had come is because God had said it. It is, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, as believers, we do not judge things based upon what we see, based upon the physical. The Apostle Paul could say we walk by what? Faith and not by sight. In other words, we trust what God says to be the state of affairs. We look at the Word of God and we trust that man has it wrong and God has it right. So above all, we must trust God above our senses, above our reasoning. And of course, the age of reason written by Thomas Paine and that whole ideology that grew up a couple of hundred years ago, that everything is about the intellect of man, man figuring out things. And intellect was elevated to the chief place. Yes, we, we use our intellect, but intellect is not the chief thing. God's truth is the chief thing. Intellect is but a means of learning the word of God. It is not the thing to be worshipped in itself. But also, to whom the end had come. In verse 2 it says, unto the land of Israel. Peter says in 1 Peter 4 verse 17, that it's time for judgment to begin where? At the house of God. And of course, if it begins with the house of God, where will the unrighteous and ungodly be or appear? We as the church, we must be judged by the word of God. As we stood in the city center yesterday, most of the people were apathetic. We just look like some weird group standing there to them we are less than relevant but we understand that the word of god is the most relevant thing in this world there's nothing as relevant as the, as the word of god and therefore as we come here this morning we come to be judged by the word to be ruled by the word and to worship the word of god above all other thoughts above all other ways but notice also the equitable justice of this end in verses 3 and 4. It is according to thy ways and all thine abominations, I will recompense thy ways and thine 
abominations. God's justice is perfect. And this is why this chapter is encouraging. This chapter is encouraging. Because God is not only a judge, but a perfect judge. He gets all things right. In fact, when Paul is described in the gospel in Romans 3, and I think it's verse 26, and when he talks about God justifying the ungodly, Paul puts it this way, that God may be just and the justifier of the one that believes in Christ. We worship God because he's not like a human judge that can be bribed or can be swayed by opinion. We see that, don't we? We see even our judges in our in our day swayed by the opinion of the times rather than making righteous judgments. Quite often, even these judges and magistrates of our lands are swayed by the opinions of men. God is not. God is not moved by what the populace think, what the, what the people think. God makes righteous judgment. And that's why in Revelation chapter 19, when we have in those first six verses, this description in that chapter of the judgment of God upon the wicked, we have the only occurrence four times of the word hallelujah in the New Testament. And it's in the context of God's perfect judgment on the reprobate. Not just because God is judging them, but because of the forensic and exact nature of God's judgment. We will worship God in eternity because, in a sense, we will stand back, or in reality, we will stand back and we say, he does all things well. Not just a general casting people away, but in in every act of judgment, God will be worshipped. Notice its fearfulness in verse 4. And mine eye shall not spare thee. In Isaiah, the verse we use on the posters in the city center, the abortion posters that we use, there's a quote from Isaiah, I think it's chapter 13, where it says, And their eye, speaking of the Assyrians, their eye shall not spare children. We use that in the, the context of that poster. But here, it's God's eye that will not spare. It's God's eye that will not spare. Neither will I have pity. That's fearful, isn't it? We live in a, in a day of grace. We live in a, in a day of mercy. We can, we can flee to God. And again, this is the encouragement of, of this passage. The encouragement of this passage is that this, for this time, has not yet happened for us. There's still an opportunity. We go back to Paul's words in, in Corinth. Now is the day of salvation. Therefore, we can flee to God, even where you're sitting at this moment. You don't need to move. You don't need to move. We don't do altar calls. In an instant of time, you can become a child of God simply in your heart believing the Lord. That's what it means to be a child of God. That's what it means to be a believer simply. And we were saying this yesterday in the city center, the the Greek word metanoia uh, that we translate into English repentance is simply a change of mind. We, We go from being those who disagree with God to those who look at things from God's perspective. And we say in the words of Paul, let God be true and every man a liar. Repentance in its most basic root idea is full agreement with the declaration and word of God. The purpose of this judgment and this phrase at the end of verse 4 is repeated at least three times in the chapter. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. That is, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, the definition of eternal life. John 17, verse 3, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. But here, the idea is not salvation. Here, the idea is judgment. But the the principle is the same. 
The principle is we either know God as a God of judgment or we know God as our Savior. It says of the Lord Jesus Christ that that stone, that whoever falls upon that stone or that rock shall be broken, but on whomsoever that stone shall fall shall be crushed. In both senses, there's a direct, intimate relationship with Christ. One as judge and one as Savior. If we will not know the Lord in this world as our Savior, we will one day know him as our judge. This phrase, I can't remember how many times is used in Ezekiel, but it is constantly repeated in these chapters. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. You see, people in their sin don't want to know him, but that's not an option. That's not an option. <laughs> we don't have that escape clause, you know, remember as children, and children would um, argue over what game to play and some might like to play this game and there'd be a debate and in the end maybe I remember as as a child in the end saying oh we can't agree and we'd walk away from each other that's not an option with the Lord we will know him one way or the other and you see that's not a threat that's not God telling us do this or else God is saying that is the necessary reality of the relationship between the creator and his creation. There is no way out of that relationship. God can't just ignore people. He deals with them either in grace or in judgment. Therefore, we must know him. Also, in verses 5 and 6, we have the unstoppable, relentless nature of this judgment. It's come. An evil and only evil. It's almost like that all other evils are almost neutral in comparison to this evil in verse 5. This unstoppable force, this relentless judgment has come and everything else becomes irrelevant compared to this relentless judgment of God. It's fearful in verse 6. It watcheth for thee. Behold, it has come. There's illustrations that come to mind, but for the sake of time, we'll press on. Secondly, in verses 7 to 15, we have the end is near. Now, the first one in verses 1 to 6, the idea was time. Now, in verses 7 to 15, the idea is space. It's a spatial nearness. So, in a time sense, it's come already. It's here. It's at the door. But now, also, this idea, but a slight different emphasis. We have a, a phrase, you know, invading my space. And in fact, at the, at the outreach yesterday, one of the brothers was saying that, you know, maybe sometime in the near future, even the use of the word repentance is going to be made illegal because, in a sense, when you use a word of that, you are invading someone's space. And not only are you invading their physical space, you're invading their mental space. And these will be the arguments in the future that will be used to forbid such terms being used. Here God is invading the space of those who don't want God. They don't want him. They want God, and you, you often see this with people. Oh yeah, you go to church, you, you know, you worship God in your building and go off there, but stay there. They don't want God invading into their life. That's not an option. That's not an option, is it? Judgment is described in verse 7 as an awakening. The morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land. The time is come. It's the morning awakening is like the idea of reality. You know, sometimes in the darkness we have all sorts of strange thoughts, but then the sun rises. You know, have you ever had the experience that you can't sleep and the one thing you're waiting for is the sun to rise? I've had that experience over the years. And then when the sun rises, then I fall asleep. But anyway, this idea of the sun awakening, the sun arising, is the, the clear light of day and everything becoming more real. So the people are living in the darkness of sin, in the darkness of their own imagination, but the sun is going to rise. The morning is coming. Of course, sin prospers in the night, but God's judgment 
is like the sun that displaces the darkness and makes everything clear to view. We see judgment distinguished in also verse 7. It's the day of trouble is near and not the sounding again of the mountains. In other words, there's different possibilities here. It could be the idea of when the vintage comes, they shout the, the vintage is ripe, or it could be the the calling to the tops of the mountains to escape from the enemy. But the point is here, there is no escape. Not the sounding again of the mountains. There will be nowhere to hide. It is a conquering judgment in verse 8. Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee, accomplish mine anger. Paul puts it this way in Romans 3 verse 19, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty. Not that we're not guilty already, but that it might be seen that we are guilty. And again, we need this. This is not bad news. This is good. Because this is reality. This is real. This is the way the world is. We mentioned yesterday in the preaching in the city that every day, nine million people die in this world. We cannot escape it. And people are walking around with their head in the sand trying to escape the reality of the one reality in life, which is death. And God brings us his truth, and we need this truth. Notice it's a comprehensive judgment. Again, in verse 8, it is all thine abominations shall be recompensed. No stone shall be left unturned. Also, it is, as we said earlier, relentless. Verse 9. It is a purposeful judgment. And ye shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. Somebody said recently that we need to get rid of the God of the Old Testament and, you know, accept the God of the New Testament. But here it's, ye shall know that I am the Lord. It's me that does it. So Amos and Isaiah could talk about evil in the city, and the Lord has done it. This is God's work. This is the true God. This is the God with whom we have to do. One of the reasons for polytheism, and that's not the belief that poly is God, that's the belief that there are many gods, a multitude of gods. Why do people want a multitude of gods? Because then they can pick and choose the god they like. I remember as a young Roman Catholic going in, and you know, if you lost something, you went to, was it St. Anthony? You know, with different needs, you go to a different saint. That's very good from a, a creature point of view because we have control. The problem with reality is this. There is only one God. There's only one God and we can't manipulate him. We have to change. We must change. We must agree with him. There is no option. There's a funny story told, and I, I think this is a made-up story, and it's given different nationalities. We'll give it the uh, British-Irish version. You know, there's a British warship, and suddenly on the radar, an Irish ID comes up, and the Irish say to the British warship, you need to move. We're on a collision course. And the British warship says back, well, actually, no, this is Her Majesty's, you know, such and such and such, and we're a big, powerful ship. You need to move. The response from the, the Irish is this. We're a lighthouse. Your call. <laughs> and the point is this. If it was two ships, they could have debated it. But there was no debate. And that's the way it is. Uh, that's a made-up story, but it, it works. Uh, that's the way it is for our relationship with God. God is immovable. And God cannot change. If God could change, he would not be God. We must change by the very nature of our creaturehood, of our, of our status as creatures, of temporal beings. We must change. It's illogical to have it any other way. It's a present judgment, verse 10. The day has come. The morning has gone forth. In other words, it's already here. It's happening. It is now. The rod had blossomed. There's no way back. 
Two reasons are given for judgment in verses 10 and 11. Pride and violence. Do we not see that in our day? Sin of pride, where pride is boasted of. Violence, we've seen terrible violence even this week in our nation. Apparently, we, we looked this up, apparently there's a, and a, again, I think our, our, our calculations were right, there's a woman killed every 24 days in this country. Violence has risen up. We need judgment. We need judgment. We see the devastating consequences of judgment in verse 11. None shall remain, nor their multitude, nor of theirs, neither shall there be wailing for them. You know, even the most godless people like to think they're remembered. We all like to think that at our funeral, there will be many people crying for our memory. Here, there will be no such memory. We see the divine counsel in the context of approaching judgment in verses 12 and 13. It's quite a practical piece of advice. Don't let the buyer rejoice. Why? Because you bought something, you're never going to use it. The seller shall not return to that which is sold. Neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. All the fun is over. All your your sin is finished. It's at an end. Reality has come. But it gets worse in verse 14 and 15. There's no response in the context of judgment. It says in verse 14, But none goeth to the battle. There's different ways to understand this, but the way we're going to interpret it this morning is that all the warnings are there, but nobody stirs. Nobody moves. God and his warnings are less than irrelevant. We come this morning to confess that God's warnings are not only worth grabbing our attention, but necessarily so. We must respond. We must respond to the warnings of God. Then in verses 16 to 19, we see feeble escape or an escape that is a vain human effort of salvation. And, And this is the other problem, isn't it? Because in the first 15 verses, the picture has been that judgment is coming. There's no response. There, people just apathetically ignore God. But now in verses 16 to 19, there's what's metaphorically, or in these words, a sort of a human attempt at salvation. So in verse 16, there's some level of escape, but only to the mountains where they wander like doves in the valleys and so on. They escape. But the escape is of no real benefit. Their knowledge of sin doesn't lead them to salvation. It just leads them to grief and mourning. You see, grieving over sin in verse 16 does not equate to salvation. People grieve. I remember working in a certain place and a colleague came to me and said, you know, I'm such, I don't go into detail, but he he, he confessed his sin. He said how much he, he hated his sin and how much of a sinner he was, but that's where it stopped. You see, it's not just about knowing how sinful you are. It's about that knowledge leading you to the source and the place where your sin is dealt with. The resulting weakness in verse 17, sin has a way and rejection of God and rebellion from God literally has a a feebling effect. The knees, the hands are feeble. The knees shall be as weak as water. And when we we live in sin, it, it drains us of our energy. We see the opposite in Psalm 92, at, at the closing verses of Psm 92, where the, the old, those who are in the house of God, they flourish, they blossom, they bring forth fruit in old age, but here the sinner is seen as feeble and weak as water. The necessary shame is in verse 18. Yes, they gird themselves with sackcloth, which is the imagery of repentance. Horror shall cover them, and shame shall be upon all faces, and baldness upon their heads. In other words, they have the emblems 
the symbols of repentance. So the application of that today, would people be, well, I go to church once a week. I have the symbol of repentance. I have the appearance of repentance. Also, they cast aside all they trusted and all that they'd given their lives for. In verse 19, their silver is in the streets, their gold is removed, their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of God and of the Lord and everything that they put value in. Their new car, their new house, their four holidays a year, whatever it is, none of this in the day of judgment becomes of any use. They trusted in uncertain riches. Whereas the scripture tells us that we are redeemed not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. We need to have a biblical economy. See things and value things. You know, the the jeweler, you know, not that I've ever had much experience in this, I've gone to jewelers with precious stones, but what do they do? They take out their their light glass thing and they, they look closely. We need to look closely. We need to look closely at what really matters at what really is valuable. What's valuable this morning is to know the Lord. Isaiah has the same idea, doesn't he? In Isaiah 2, verse 20, he says, In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver, of gold, in which they made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bass. And finally, on this third point, notice the emptiness of sin. They shall not satisfy their souls neither fill their bells because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. Sin does not satisfy. Sin is not good for us. You know, there's lots of bad food that gives a temporary sense of being filled, but it's not good for you. Personal experience in that area. It's not good for you. And this is the idea, isn't it? That sin is used as a filler, Sin is used as a satisfier, but there is no satisfaction with sin. It only brings shame. Fourthly, and very briefly, the end of the temple. There's three ideas in verses 20 to 22. In verse 20, we have the removal of the temple because of idolatry. And and God is saying in, in, in verse 20, I will no longer allow you to use my temple as a place of idolatry. And this is why Christ made the whips and twice at the beginning of his ministry, at the end of his ministry, drove the money sellers from the temple and said, you will not use my father's house as a den of thieves and robbers. God is saying exactly the same here in this verse. It's given to strangers in verse 21. Better to give it to strangers than to have my professed people abuse it in their idolatry. And also, the removal of God's face, which is much worse than the removal of the temple in verse 22. God removes his face, and the result is defilement. It's the opposite, isn't it? In 2 Corinthians is chapter 3, where Paul describes at the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, as we as we gaze into the face of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, that we are transformed, we are, we are made into that image, that image of Christ, that image of God. Well, here, the opposite is the case. Here, the case is that as God turns his face away from us, that we are polluted. We are polluted. You see, there is no third option, is there? There is no third option. We are either made more into the image of our God and in the words of Wesley, change from glory into glory, which is based on those verses in 2 Corinthians 3, or we are more defiled by having no relationship with the Lord. Lastly, we have not just the end of the temple, but the end of all things in verses 23 to 27. 
We have the end of freedom. Verse 23, make a chain. Again, because of the crimes, the violence, make a chain. Remember in Charles Dickens, the and when Ebenezer Scrooge is faced with what's ahead of him, what's the symbol that's used? Chains. There's that image of this ginormous, gigantic chain waiting for Scrooge unless he repents. Now we know Dickens was more more of a moralist than a than a believer, of course. But the principle is the same. We're not saved by morals, but we are saved by knowing the Lord. It's not about becoming a better person. It's about meeting with the living God. The end of freedom, the end of proper property they shall possess, that is, the enemies will, the heathen will possess their houses again, that which they thought was their possession. There's no such thing. Get this. There's no such thing in the, in the, in the ultimate sense, in the real sense, as ownership. Yes, we, we can say we own our houses. It's only for as long as we live. It's only temporary. Everything in this world is temporary. Someone said that the, they don't put pockets in death robes. No need for them. The end of property. The end of strength. I will make the pomp of the strong to cease. The end of religion. The end of their religion. Their holy places shall be defiled. The end of peace. Verse 25, destruction cometh, they shall seek peace, and there shall be none. You see, people want peace, but they don't want the God of peace. John MacArthur so well said that all the blessings of Christ are not to be found in themselves. In other words, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, all those fruits of the, the fruit of the Spirit is not to be found by individually seeking those things. And this is the problem with Eastern mysticism, Buddhism and Hinduism, all those religions that, that seek these inner peace, these inner joy, whatever it is, they cannot be found in themselves. But they're all found in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of them is found in him. The end of preaching. Maybe some of you are saying when. <laughs> the end of preaching, verse 26. Mischief shall come. Rumor shall be upon rumor. Then they shall seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest and counsel from the angels. A time will come when those people who ignored the, the priest who ignored the prophet, they will go and there will be no message. The end of the people from the king right down to the whole nation in verse 27. The king shall mourn. The prince shall be clothed with desolation. The hands of the people of the land shall be troubled. From the top to the bottom, the end of all. And finally, the reason and purpose of all this, I will do unto them after their way, and according to their deserts will I judge them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. May the Lord enable us to know him, not as our judge, but as our Savior. Amen. Let's sing from Psalm 51. Psalm 51 and verses 16 to 19. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it thee, nor wilt thou with burnt offering at all delighted be. A broken spirit is to God a pleasing sacrifice, a broken and a contrite heart. Lord, thou wilt not despise. And the same God who is the God who brings judgment is the same God who has the ability to bring comfort to our hearts. We will remain seated to sing and then we'll stand for a brief word of prayer. For thou desirest not sacrifice as would I give it.
is to God a pleasing sacrifice, a broken and a contrite heart. Lord, Thou wilt not despise. To Zion, thine own hill, the walls of thy Jerusalem build up of thy good will, then righteous offerings shall be. That's time for prayer. Our God and Father, we confess that so often our religion can be an outward appearance. Father, we we pray that that the reality of true faith and true relationship with the living God would be our experience. Lord, deal with us in mercy. Continue to speak thy truth to us and, Lord, grant us those hearts and minds and souls that will respond in saving faith and genuine repentance so that we would come to Calvary, come to the cross and be refreshed and be renewed and be regenerated by the Spirit of Christ. Bless us now as we Turn to the Lord's table. Bless our souls. In the Savior's name. Amen. Amen.